I presented at JuliaCon maybe in. Is this good? Uh, I presented at JuliaCon in 2016, and it's maybe a good time to give an update of where we are. Um, we're working on robot uh, motion estimation. That's the Rome package, and Caesar is kind of the umbrella. Um, but it actually depends on about 100 Julia packages underneath, so it's actually quite enormous. Um, I'm with the Julia Robotics group. Um, I think there's, there's more of us here, um, so definitely reach out if you want to want to ask or get in touch. Um, so I'm going to talk about something called simultaneous localization and mapping, and then just a little bit about the algorithm that we use in developing, and then just some key examples. Um, the, we've, we heard a bit about simulation and the aerial vehicles and control. Uh, and another area of robotics that you need is understanding where you are uh, and what does the world around you look like. And you need to know that before you can build the autonomy and interact with it. Um, key example is what if GPS goes away? You're stuck. <laughs> if you're underwater, how do you do that? Um, so imagine some system that has some state variables that you're interested in, maybe a robot in its position in the world. Um, and we are interested in estimating, based on some kind of sensor input and various sensors, uh, what these state variables are. And then something changes. Maybe it's over time something changes or, uh, or, or any changes in the system that we're interested in. Um, so we'd like to somehow mathematically model this interaction between, I don't know if the cursor is making it through, no, um, an interaction between these state variables, maybe xk and xk plus 1. Um, and we'd like to do this in a sort of more rigorous and probabilistic way. And the way we like to do it is with something called factor graphs, where we actually draw visual graphical models of, of the variables and the factors of interest. So the big circles here we think of as variables. Think of a disposition, velocity, orientation, maybe sensor calibration, um, something like that. Um, and then factors, this, this math, the algebra that ties these things together. It doesn't have to be a closed form math, maybe numerical is good enough, but, but something tells you how they tie together. Um, so when you're projecting from maybe the, this blue dot as, this, as the factor, um, some belief in probability space from xk to xk plus 1, that primary operation is a convolution. Right? And if you have outside information that you're bringing in as like absolute information, you bring it in as a prior. That's the unary. And these factors can be connected to variables in, in, in multiple different ways. So I thought I'd just jump in and just show just like a canonical example of what does this look like. Um, you want to be able to build this graphical model based on sensor data that you get and your own factor types uh, and your local situation. So you build um, what we call a distributed factor graph because it can live on a database, it can live over the cloud, it can live in memory. So we're doing a lot of work in making that plumbing work properly. Then you add variables, maybe x1, and then you add a prior, and that's the factor, and then you add another variable, and so you can grow. And then when you want to trigger this algorithm to do the inference to get the best marginal estimate of xk and xk plus 1, you'd call solve tree. And one of the things that makes this algorithm special is that if you want to recycle computations from one, um, you know, you, you build a problem, you solve it, and you change the problem slightly, and you solve it again, which is a regular thing in robotics, then you'd feed the tree structure back in, and it'll actually recycle computation accordingly. All right, but now you, you move around some more and you get more information, maybe some measurement. So in filtering world, when we build Kalman filters, we would mob, try and get the average, the weighted average between these two. Um, but now we have to try and think about doing this in a non-Gaussian way. Uh, so how would we do that? And this is kind of one of the main motivations for using the graphical language. Just before I do, the core pr operation here is a product of functions in, in the belief space. So we could add this prior over here as a measurement belief. So this is a pretty small example of a factor graph. Um, but then you could solve that and get, uh, get your best estimates. And, 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 and think of these things as being really weird shapes in some, you know, on some manifold somewhere. Now I'm going to jump to a big example. Um, the DARPA Robotics Challenge came up, and um, I was not one of the teams. Um, that shout out to Robin as well. He was <laughs> he's here and was as well. Um, and some of the work we did there and following from that is let's build a much bigger factor graph. Right? So just as a show of example, the pelvis, the, the green variables, the feet down through kinematics, the head, and the camera sees features in the world. What these graphical structures allow you to do is build the problem graphically and then solve it. So you, you can break the problem in, in two parts. Um, sort of t coming off the trajectory optimization, we can maybe start thinking about doing this into the future as well, not just historic data, but future data. 
Um, we haven't done this yet, but we, we're yearning to do it. Um, but I thought I'd just at least mention it. So think of a computational system that considers maybe 30 seconds back into the past and 10 seconds into the future, and there's this computation that's happening, and it gives the robot this sort of dynamic awareness of its environment. All right, just a little bit on the algorithm. Um, that the algorithm, I think, is sort of special um, in, in some ways. The, we, build, we want to build a factor graph, like the one on the left, which has more than just Gaussian links. So I'm going to just jump back, sorry, to this one. Here we just assumed everything would be Gaussian, and I think the computer jumped through this one. But we'd like to be able to build a graph that has all sorts of uncertainty in it. And if you try and solve it, you will get highly, highly non-Gaussian behavior. For example, um, the two purple, the feature dots with that little cross in it, you have an association. You've got a measurement, but you don't know who it associates with. Maybe a camera sees an exit sign, but you don't know which one of two or three exit signs it is. Maybe your past history here is this like intensity map, which is really strange. Maybe you've got kinematics with joints and backlash. You've got these multiple peaks. Um, and that's what we'd like to be able to, um, to work with. And the way we do it is we convert to a Bayes tree, uh, or a, it's also a junction tree or an elimination tree. We call it a Bayes tree because we do a few special tricks to it. Um, and, and we do believe that's, that's the right way to go. I know the Bayesian or non-parametric inference world has avoided doing trees for dimensionality problems, um, but, but we have strong reasons for doing that. So we convert this problem algebraically through an elimination game using AMD ordering, um, and then we want to solve that. So in robotics, we can then manipulate this tree and get a whole bunch of special stuff out of it. I mentioned the recycling of computations, um, the ability to work with multiple robots at the same time, um, we can do marginalization accurately. We can initialize the variables accurately. Um, and in many ways, working with these graphical structures replaces matrix-based methods of before. We still use a lot of matrices internally when we're doing gradients, et cetera. Um, and, but the tree solving, you're doing message passing from the leaves up to a root and then back down, is, is the same as LU and QR decomposition in, in, in the sort of more general nonlinear, non-Gaussian fashion. That's where AMD was developed, by the way. A core operation here is in this tree now, we have to propagate belief. So imagine that you're assembling information from the measurement data up to the root, so you're getting these multiple messages coming in. So think of this blue and red as, as whatever your marginal belief is at that point in time. Then you're going to mix it with the local clique information and pass it on, up on the tree. So just to jump back, I'm talking about this operation here. Um, these two center modes are unlikely. Blue because of red and red because of blue. So the pink, the two bimodal that comes out is, is what you want to approximate. And we're using our algorithm is built in Julia to do this as efficiently as we know how at the moment, and we're actively still developing it. And we can do this on manifolds. So think about if um, we don't just live in a, we live in three-dimensional space, but a robot moves in rotation and their sensor calibration values that happen on some of these weird sub-manifolds. Um, so we want the ability to multiply products or take products or functions in on some manifolds. I'm using just a circle here as an example. So multiply blue and green to give you yellow. Um, so you, it's most likely that you're here on the left or on two sides or in between or also in between on the other side. So this is the other. So convolutions and products are sort of the core operations. And some of the future things we want to look into is Bellman optimality of these um, algorithms, and I can maybe talk more afterwards if someone's interested. I'll just skip through for the sake of time, and, and this is sort of an ongoing future research for us. And I thought I'll just skip through a few examples quickly. Um, it's classic target tracking. Imagine you've got a bearing and a range measurement for something flying overhead. You can build a factor graph where each of the measurements are these red factors, and at T0, T1, T2, those are the variables of interest. What's interesting is you're estimating on a manifold which is cylindrical, so rotations and translation. Um, and these pose positions I've, I've draped over in the, on, on the green there. So the, the blue are the marginal estimates from different positions in time. Here's another fun little example, a canonical example, acoustic localization, um, where we buy a $5 camera with a microphone array. We set up two speakers with unique uh, acoustic chirps and we solve the triangle and we localize where is this camera and microphone array uh, just using the acoustics, and then we can vary the speed of sound. So he has a, a fit, and we're able to estimate the speed of sound and measure it for $5, which I thought was pretty fun. What about a much bigger example? Here's an underwater robot where 
we build a factor graph using this, these beliefs at the bottom shown here, it's clearly very non-Gaussian, but we assemble it in the factor graph and we solve. So um, I can talk more about this afterwards, but you can clearly see that the vehicle starts, this is the Charles River in Boston, and does a trajectory over about eight minutes and comes out. Yes, there is a small gap in there, but understand that I never did any engineering to process this data. I took the correlator output raw from the acoustic sensor and I plugged it into Caesar um, and I was able to solve it. So a little bit of engineering will go a long way. Or a car, these uncertain associations um, that I've uh, spoken about before, this ability to, I see two things or three things and I don't know which one's which, so I just build the factor graph as such and keep moving. Um, there's a ground truth and a, uh, a found solution. So there's, there's a lot more to say, please reach out. Um, any questions? Thanks. We are slightly over time, so um, please just have your discussions on offline, okay? Sure. Yeah, no sorry. Thank you. <laughs>